we now have dr raji solomon with us her topic for today will be on 3d printing and advancing forefront in surgical endodontic therapy she's completed her mds mfds in glasgow uk she's a professor in department of conservative dentistry and endodontics we welcome you ma'am thank you for being part of the virtual world dental conference 2020 I now request you to maximize your presentation screen and start your presentation. Warm greetings to everyone. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you for that kind introduction and. i want to thank all of you for this pristine opportunity to talk in this um, really wonderful virtual event of the world dental conference i am dr raji vaila solomon i work as a professor in the department of conservative dentistry and endodontics at pananya institute of dental sciences and research center located at hyderabad india so the topic that i have selected today is on 3d printing also known as rapid prototyping and how we can utilize this advancing technology in our surgical endodontic treatment planning so to begin with i came across this interesting picture on the internet the other day where uh, this picture speaks a thousand words i don't need to say it but it is just a reminder of how man is constantly building now usually when we build we use Uh, solid structures and we make large load bearing structures so that it can absorb impact and weather storms so we use dense solids like steel or rock concrete glass etc however what do we learn from nature if you look at nature nature generally tends to use more cellular material or porous material so material which have a lot of um, voids inside their material matrix so which makes them lightweight yet relatively stiff and able to absorb impact for example if you look at this picture of the human bone now you can see that this bone is not a dense solid but it has a little bit of solid uh, you know dense areas around the load bearing surface and later on you have a lot of cellular or porous material where uh, where it is required to bear the load it is more dense and solid not otherwise this is because if the entire bone was solid it would not make us very functional because it would be very difficult for us to move we would need more energy to move so this is not evolutionally very uh, efficient so this is a lesson that we can get from nature nature is very efficient and very well designed in in its ways so how do we uh, manufacture our design tool to mimic nature to react and respond like nature does to absorb energy impact how do we change the way of our technology and the material and the designing that we do so that we can make materials that are strong lightweight functional and absorb energy from impact now most of uh, until now the uh, most of what all the products that we see around us follow this concept of subtractive manufacturing where you take a big chunk of metal and it is selectively removed by a lathe or a cutting tool layer by layer till we get the desired shape that we want so most of the manufacturing technologies be it from the beginning of the lost wax process to injection molding vacuum pressing forging sand casting sculpting all work or revolve around subtractive manufacturing here we have to make the die the pattern or the mold but can we um, can we change this to create something which is slightly different so let me just give an example the products that we commonly see around us for example the chair that we see should it be designed like this can we change the mind set to design a chair like this is it possible to get a cutting tool or a lathe to bend curve and to design something which is less denser and has a lattice structure slightly a different type of um, you know engineering design this is made possible by the birth of additive manufacturing additive is the proper just a position for the word subtractive here what we do is we are not removing layers of material but we are adding material bit to bit until we get the desired shape that we want 
So how does um, you know this particular technology work and where all it can be used is what this talk will be covering. Now, additive manufacturing, as we have already heard a lot of lecturers, uh, uh, speakers before talk about 3D printing, rapid prototyping. These are all the similar terminologies that are used for this particular technology. And there is a, such a big boom in the past decade on this technology, and it has myriad applications, not only in the medical field, but it's interestingly used in a lot of aerospace uh, research because uh, the main advantage of this technology is that you can make very fine, customized, specific designs that you want, curved, complex designs. So we have a lot of freedom about, over the geometric design that we want. So finer parts, we don't need to wait for a spare part. We can just get it printed if we have the design in a digital in a digital scan available. So this is the advantage and it is used in a lot of other fields. It is used in, you know, making very intricate uh, construction designs in fashion design for making clothes, shoes, etc. And of course, yes, it is used in a big way, especially in a prosthetic field where complex structures can be intricately designed using this particular technology so that it is patient specific and the it will you know adapt to the contour of the bone that is there so it is also having a boon in the tissue engineering um, you know um, technology where 3d tissue scaffolds are also being printed so will this uh, technology of 3d printing start changing everything so if you see, it actually works like a regular printer. A regular printer prints using inkjet onto a piece of paper. Similar way, from the bottom upwards, a 3D printer starts printing um, this, any material that you want. It can actually print ceramics, metals, plastics, resins, polymers, biodegradable materials, or even living cells can be printed using these 3D printers. So the entire birth is uh, of this 3D printing is credited to Dr. Charles Hull, who later was co-founded the 3D systems. And the first technique that he actually invented was an SLA printer. And the concept is where you take a 3D digital model. So it can be uh, either a scanned data of a CT or it can be an MRI scan if it's going into a medical uh, for a medical model. So whatever it is a digital format and then it gets sliced into various cross sectional layers. So it becomes 2D slices and then it is fed into a 3D printer and the 3D printer prints in the material of the choice that you have selected from the bottom to the top until the entire model is printed. Now, uh, though uh, Charles had begun with uh, the, the birth started with the SLA printer, there are various other printers that are also available. Now, if you have come across a 3D printer, the most common one that probably you have seen on your in your laboratories or in your offices or on the benchtop is a FDM printer, which is also stands for Fused Deposition Modeling Printer. Now, this is most commonly used because the material that is used, uh, the, the filament that is used is usually a uh, polymer like nylon, a thermoplastic polymer, either polyester or nylon. This goes through one end. This is the filament and it gets pushed out through a hot nozzle and it melts and then it deposits on a build plate the material layer by layer until a 3D object emerges. Another variety of the printer that we have is the stereolithography, which is usually used for your resins and your ceramics. Now, coming to your stereolithography, it is like you're 3D printing an object out of a pool of photoreactive resin. So when a UV light falls upon it, this resin solidifies and forms the layer of the object that you are printing. Definitely an SLA printer gives you better surface details and finer um, you know, uh, morphological details than an FDM printer. Now, another variety of the printer that you commonly see is the laser printer. Now, these laser printers are usually more expensive and they are found in, uh, you know, they, they're used for printing metal and they are also used in huge industries for their purposes where a high powered laser over a bed of super fine powder fuses the powder particles together. And then this process is repeated until the object is completed. Now, coming to polyjet, this is just the nozzle, how it varies. It throws out photoreactive resins into tiny droplets onto a build surface, and immediately the resin, the material, begins to harden with UV light. Now, these it's actually a combination of your FDM and SLA, and these are usually the most expensive 3D printers that are available. 
So in a nutshell, what 3D printing does is it takes the visual data, that is a computerized drawing or a CAD data or a 3D scanning data. The printer takes that information, it converts it. Now suppose it is a, for you're using it for a medical purpose, you will have a DICOM file. DICOM stands for Digital Imaging Communications in Medicine. That is data, that is the raw data that is got either because of a CT scan, you need a three-dimensional scan or an MRI. Next, what it is, it converts it to a STL file format, which is a printable version. And then that is fed, this STL format is fed into the 3D printer until the object is made. So these are the various processes that are uh, come into picture. So it, is this the rebirth of medical practice? Is there a, a different uh, paradigm shift? Is it a game changer in medical technology? Now, if you see in the past, this is how an operating room used to be. You used to have a single doctor. There was not much social distancing. There's not the, you know, the concept of disinfection with masks or gloves. And you have a lot of students all around or observing the doctor. Whereas today in the present, this is exactly how you see. You don't see many people around. You feel more screens, more, more of, uh, you know, robots and digitalization all around you. And this is exactly where we are heading, where, you know, 3D printing is uh, going to be definitely... It is already the future and it is going to be a bigger future. Now, the concept in medical field is not just to print so that you can rehearse or have a mock surgery, but it is also becoming a boon in the concept of uh, bioprinting, which is nothing but uh, 3D printing organs. Now, this idea is definitely going to be a game changer because lab grown tissues could mean the end of testing. It could mean the end of research in animals and humans, thereby giving a big boon to the pharmaco pharmaceutical research. And it will also help us to, if organs can be printed out, it will help us to overcome the organ shortage and improve the situation of organ do donations. So around, I think in the year 2014, the first liver tissue was 3D printed and it functioned as a real liver for weeks. And then uh, heart tissue, uh, synthetic skin, L'Oreal is um, in playing in hand with one of the biggest 3D printing companies and they're trying to actually print 3D print out synthetic skin to suit patient specific needs. So in future, definitely your surgeon can take out a patient's tissue sample or stem cells or DNA data, and it can be fed into a, um, you know, a 3D printer and you can regenerate the tissue that you want for your particular purpose. And um, it is also very advantageous because most of the hearing aids today, about 96% is what data shows are, are, are hearing aids are 3D, are 3D printed. And um, the, it also reduces, now if you have a huge surgery, uh, like a jaw surgery, it definitely helps to reduce the surgeon's time because you can 3D print the entire jaw, you can 3D print the defect, you can keep it on your table top, you can analyze the defect, you can plan your, the surgery. So all this doesn't need to be done on the patient, it can be rehearsed and thereby the, it can reduce the surgery time. So this is one of the major advantages that we face. And this is an image of the first 3D printed dental implant. And this is a 3D printed titanium jaw. So uh, it enables reconstruction of the bone to produce a patient specific implant. So especially very, very important when you want very intricate designs and movements to be made, those finer details can be 3D printed. Now coming to um, its applications in, um, um, mainly in the branch of field of endodontics. So this was published in the Journal of Endodontics by Van Devmeer and Gulabiwala in the year 2016, where what they did is they treated a calcified canal, a completely obstructed root canal space using a 3D printed template, which had a port into which the guide or into which the handpiece head was introduced so that the canal could be accurately negotiated. So they had actually taken a scan, a CT scan, and then they had virtually prepared a, a template, which was later on printed in a material through which the instrument was then introduced to negotiate the canal. So this is better than doing a blind tunneling procedure or a freehand drilling into the procedure. Other advantages is the material wastage is very less. It is more accurate and you have undisturbed material properties. Now in endodontics, it is also important that, that uh, 3D printed molar teeth stimulating the internal intricacies of the anatomy are also being introduced so that files can be also 3D printed accordingly so that it can best adapt and uh, you can clean and shape the root canal space.
Now, coming into surgical endodontics, we have a definite list of indications that are required. So if we have a patient who needs a surgical drainage or you know, there's a failed surgical retreatment case or a failed surgical um, you know, treatment or a large refractory lesion with persistent periapical symptoms and not, uh, not uh, responding, to the conventional uh, traditional treatment or procedural errors or calcific metamorphosis, we need to perform a periapical surgery. And some of the difficulties that we encounter routinely when we do a surgery is assessment of the size, extent of the defect, the uh, nearby noble vital structures, the flap, how do we extend the design, the soft tissue retraction, exactly where is the pathology, how, how do we plan the osteotomy, how do we accurately identify the apis, the root from the surrounding bone and visibility and isolation. So when we have this technology, everything can be studied. The defect also can be uh, marked with a different color. So here you have the paleto incisal view of the lesion. You have the mesiodistal dimension of the lesion. So all this is analyzed, which uh, this is information which we will not get in a routine 2D scan. So a 3D scan is, uh, of course, uh, we all know that joint of having a 3D scan because we measure it in voxels. So you get the entire width, the depth and the breadth of the image can be captured. So uh, the role of CBCT plays a big part of endodontic armamentarium today. So lesions can be visualized in all dimensions and you can take a coronal view, a sagittal view, axial view as per your requirement. After that, a physical model of the surgical site and then a soft tissue retractor can be also because this is a 3D reconstruction that is done and accordingly a model or a retractor can be also virtually designed. This is a virtual design. Later on, it is converted into a 3D printed guide so that the osteotomy can be performed only at the area of the lesion and your entire bone does not need to be affected. Now, however, though CBCT is a promising tool uh, and it does overcome a lot of uh, limitations like anatomical noise, geometric distension, and it helps us to visualize the true extent of a lesion the position statement of the European Society of Endodontics and American Association of Endodontics said that it should be considered only in the preoperative assessment and management of complex periradicular surgery, keeping in mind to make the radiation dose optimized as low as possible when exposing patients to the ionizing radiation, and it must be justified and be utilized only when it enhances the management of the case. The smallest field of view that is suitable for that particular situation should be used, more relevant for younger patients who are more sensitive to the stochastic effects of radiation. And the effective dose of a CBCT scanner is approximately 13 um, millis, um, micro sieverts, which is in the same magnitude of two to three standard periapical exposures. Now, this is how a 3D template has been uh, prepared and a retractor has been printed. This retractor has served to, after the surgery, position and hold the soft tissue flaps which are raised in sight because, uh, so that there is not much um, manipulation of the soft tissue because uh, the more kinder we are to the soft tissue, the better is going to be the healing or the outcome of the surgery. So the retractor will help optimal tissue adaptation of the wound edges, create smaller distance, epithelial migration. It, it has more rapid soft tissue healing and decreases the tissue trauma and improves the wound closure. So the key take home point is the relevance of adequate atraumatic soft tissue retraction. It cannot be underemphasized. If attention is given to this, the outcome of your surgery can be increased to almost 96.8%. Now, coming into certain case studies from the literature, this is an interesting case that was published in the Journal of uh, Endodontics in 2018, where there was a 3D printed uh, guided endodontic surgery that was uh, that was um, that was done to approach the palatal root of the upper first molar, which had a sinus. So there was even the sign, the palatine artery could be traced, the root apex could be isolated, and it could be demarcated, and a surgical stent was thereby prepared, and then the lesion was approached only to that particular area and only the palatal root. The osteotomy was done, the root and resection was done. You can see the gutta percha that is attacked, and then the palatal mucosa was repositioned and sutured with good healing. So these are some some of the cases that were already done in the literature. This is a facial approach to reach a fused distofacial root in the maxillary second molar. So again, a trifine was created with the virtual planning after which, after which the particular area alone that fused distofacial 
palatal root, that bone around that region was removed. And you can see over here the root end, the gutta percha. So the precision that we can get in that osteotomy procedure in removing and better access to our retro, retro procedures like your root end manipulation procedures like resection, filling can be done in a very minimal approached way. Here there is this case, they, again, they reported another case for where there was a lesion, non-healing lesion close to the mandibular, the mental, uh, close to the mandibular premolar in close relation to the mental foramen. Again, here they have made a 3D printed surgical guide with a trephine and then the head of the handpiece has been adjusted, uh, has been, it has been uh, fabricated in such a way the head of the handpiece is adjusted to fit accurately and the lesion was done only in that particular site. Okay, so these are different case reports that have been published. You can go through these. I've just quoted the references. So you can go through these cases where the osteotomy was performed only at the involved root ends. So without much, uh, much um, you know, difficulty, the exact area of the defect was analyzed. And accordingly, the virtually the entire surgery was designed so that the operator would know exactly where to do the procedure. And this retractor has served also to retract the soft tissues and to preserve the sound cortical bone and the periosteum overlying it. All right. Now, uh, it is in, uh, it was also interesting to note that uh, in the International Journal of Medical Robotics, the authors had also done a 3D, uh, they 3D printed their trephine burrs and then they had also uh, published this. So you can go through this. It's okay. They got excellent surgical outcomes. Now, based on all these literature studies, I have start, I did a case report using an FDM printer whereby we printed uh, a large lesion, which was non-healing in the anterior jaw. So we had the jaw that was reconstructed. This was 3D printed using a thermoplastic polymer material, PGLA. And after that, we assessed it. And then we 3D printed a, a small um, um, a, a stent to be placed, which could be intraorally placed. It was autoclaved. It was intraorally placed over this defect. And then we had performed the surgery. And we have a two-year recall of this particular case. And the patient came back in the immediate one week, immediate next day of the surgery with absolutely no uh, swelling or any, any other pain associated with the procedure, which probably would have been more in case of a conventional procedure. So this is another case where we have 3D printed. We have 3D printed the jaw. This is the positioning of the uh, guide over the jaw and the, uh, the area of the surgery, the exact area of the surgery was also identified. And then we have performed the procedure. And this is another case that we did where we had a non-healing lesion after endodontic therapy. So this is in the OPG, then it was subjected to a 3D view. The entire defect was seen. We have outlined the nasal floor so that there is no extension of this. So we are careful. So we had outlined it. And, and we also have to remember that we have to translate what we want to the 3D printer personal. You know, if you're doing it your, yourself, it's okay. But if you're sending these uh, guides or these surgical templates to be done to, to a 3D printed lab, then you have to accurately actually communicate what exactly you want so that it will accurately be printed. So we had used modeling wax in this case where we had uh, checked where the defect was and then we got it. Uh, we got even the jaw that was uh, 3D printed and here we refined the technique a little bit. So we had a nice lip retractor. So the entire soft tissue was just held in place. So there's no uh, concept of holding a retractor. So you don't have a slippage of a retractor. You don't need you know, to hold and pull the tissue. So it was very atraumatically held back. So we preserved the cortical bone. We had the preservation of the neurovascular bundle. We customized it to the individual tooth anatomy. We had better visualization. And, you know, in this era of the core, COVID-19 situation where we want to do anything which is minimally, uh, you know, invasive to the patient. We want minimum exposure of the operating site. We want to maintain isolation and adhere to strict aseptic protocols. All this is possible with these kind of technologies. So, of course, there are certain limitations. You need to think about the cost factor that will be placed. And though of, in this particular case, though I wanted to fabricate a to fine port, there was a lot of fineness because we do we tried it, it was not actually adapting to the contour. So, we have a little bit of a learning curve and you have a proper understanding of the communication to the 3D printed lab personnel. However, the accuracy, the safety, the efficacy of this nature of technique outweighs its demerits. 
Now, in the future, just two more slides to go into what is the future of the 3D printed guided endodontic surgery and where exactly is the current research? It is interesting to note that the current research is uh, was published last year in, uh, by, in the Journal of Endodontics in 2019, a technique called dynamic navigation system. Over here, basically, this technique was introduced to facilitate dental implantology procedures by improving the accuracy of placing and positioning the dental implant. This accuracy can be translated to the precision required for apicectomy and root end manipulation procedures. So over here, it will show in real time the deviation between the actual planned position of your osteotomy procedure and the orientation of the burr. So the surgeon is guided by a target which shows in real time the ideal position of the burr. So this is one of the advantages. And here the authors describe it in three steps, plan, trace, and place. So the CBCT image is matched with the real patient's job by matching the scan to the patient, which allows an accuracy check to the surgeon prior to the drilling procedure. After calibration of the handpiece in real time, the, perform, the therapy is performed. So it is advantages because it's visually controlled and it is checked. So it is a significant advantage over a static guide. You have fewer damage to the noble neurovascular bundle. It allows a minimally invasive apio, apicosectomy procedure. It allows more precision in your retrograde filling and the accuracy is close to 0.71 for the millimeters for the entry point and one mm at the apex with a mean angle of discrepancy of 2.26 degrees. So this gave a good uh, radiographic and clinical outcome in the follow-up period. However, of course, this system, because it's a dynamic uh, navigation system, you have to think about the cost factor that is involved, but there is no need for fabrication of a separate SLA template, resulting in a less expensive cost to the treatment protocol. Now, um, so I would, uh, these, is, these are some other cases that I have. You can also take down this, uh, this, uh, oh, this system. It's called the TEM system, the Targeted Endodontic Microscopy, which used a digital workflow. That is any workflow that occurs primarily to the use of converting physical or analog structures into a digital format, which can be manipulated using a computer-aided design software. So the digital data is basically done in four steps where the bone, the teeth, the defect, and the neurovascular spaces are rendered using the CBCT image technique. After that, the visible soft tissues and the occlusal surfaces are rendered using an intraoral. Uh, you can use a camera or you can use a scanner or you can use a benchtop optical scan of an impression or a cast. And then these renderings are merged together with the design software to create a 3D virtual model. And the guide design is performed in the model, which is later fed into a 3D printer. So even uh, the intricate uh, uh, designs can be digitally planned and you don't even have a 1 mm margin of error. So here you have a case where again this was uh, used. Dr. Raji Solomon. Yeah, I'm done. So just to conclude, the accuracy and reliability of a computer aided technology are, is much more than freehand drilling, uh, drilling. And in an experimental model of apicoectomy procedure that was performed, Pinsky et al. They in the year 2006 demonstrated that while freehand drilling to approach the apex deviated by two millimeters in 70% of the case of the time, three uh, by uh, sorry uh, these uh, guided tissue procedures guided endodontic tissue procedures their deviation was much less with only 0.79 millimeters was noted so freehand drilling resulted in larger osteotomy and loss of healthy bone so 3d printing definitely has its double edge uh, benefits it helps in a conservative approach more accurate uh, root resection, retrofilling, preservation of the adjacent cortical bone and minimizes the risk to the damaging vital structures. So this is a quote by the CEO of 3D Systems who said, with 3D printing, complexity is free. The printer doesn't care if it makes the most rudimentary shape or the most complex shape, and that is completely turning design and manufacturing on its head as we know it. If a picture paints a thousand words, a prototype is worth a thousand pictures. Albert Einstein said, someday after I am dead, scientists will recreate my brain with a kind of three-dimensional printing press and use it to create quotes by me instead of phony ones like this. With these few words, I would like to stop my presentation and I thank the organizing team, especially Dr. Arun, Dr. Nashra and all the others for this pristine opportunity. Then it was an overwhelming opportunity that you have given me to share this virtual web space today. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am.
Thank you for that wonderful presentation, ma'am. I must say, from just not to dentists, but also to low the the local public, the people worldwide, it would be very easy to understand all the topics that you mentioned and cases. The presentation is really appreciable by a lot of people on YouTube as well. You have received various ap appreciations. Um, Anita Samraj has said very nice presentation. Dr. Raji, we have from Marble uh, Piera, very good presentation as well. And uh, there's someone uh, from who has given a general uh, feedback saying, Madam, as a practicing dentist, what would be the typical cost of attempting to set up a 3D printing infrastructure in my practice or college? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's a very good question and a very pertinent question. Uh, basically, the cost of a 3D printer would depend on the type of material that you are thinking or looking into printing. So if you are just printing a polyester or a thermoplastic plastic material, nylon or PGLA, then you can go for a FDM printer, which is your fuse deposition modeling printer, which is a best benchtop printer. So the basic cost of that is around one lakh. What I have used is an FDM printer when I printed my surgical guides and template, and we got it for around 75,000 is what I, our institute at Panemia Hyderabad had purchased it for. Now, if uh, these FDM printers also range from somewhere around uh, 25,000, and it goes all the way up to around 3 lakhs. So it depends on the type and the quality and the precision of the surface details that you want. SLA printers, which are used to print resin, are slightly more costlier. They begin with around 3 lakhs, and the advanced versions are go around to around 6.5 lakhs or 8 lakhs too. So if you want to print ceramic, again, it depends on the type of nozzle. So if you're using extrusion nozzles, those is for uh, you know the jetting uh, nozzle, the jetting variety which is used for advanced ceramics and even the cost goes up to 1.5 crores. So basically it depends on what is the material. And metal printers, again, you have a range ranging from around 10 lakhs and if you to again going up to 20 lakhs. So it depends on the type of material that you're building so you, uh, that you want to print. So basically you can buy a FDM printer, which is uh, sufficient to do, uh, you know, for all your pre-surgical case analysis, to plan out how you will do your 3D models and to make your templates that is sufficient hope i answered the question yes i hope the same the person who's answered it uh, received a very clear answer from you as well so um, thank you ma'am thank you so much for your time and uh, yes ma'am you can uh, think you stop sharing your screen ma'am yeah sure yeah thank you so much ma'am take care thank you